Chapter 12 of The Problems of Philosophy by Bertrand Russell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Landon D.C. Elkind at the University of Iowa in Coralville, Iowa. Recorded in Durango, Colorado. Chapter 12 Truth and Falsehood. Our knowledge of truths, unlike our knowledge of things, has an opposite, namely, error. So far as things are concerned, we may know them or not know them. But there is no positive state of mind which can be described as erroneous knowledge of things, so long, at any rate, as we confine ourselves to knowledge by acquaintance. Whatever we are acquainted with must be something. We may draw wrong inferences from our acquaintance, but the acquaintance itself cannot be deceptive. Thus, there is no dualism as regards acquaintance. But as regards knowledge of truths, there is a dualism. We may believe what is false as well as what is true. We know that, on very many subjects, different people hold different and incompatible opinions. Hence, some beliefs must be erroneous. Since erroneous beliefs are often held just as strongly as true beliefs, it becomes a difficult question how they are to be distinguished from true beliefs. How are we to know, in a given case, that our belief is not erroneous? This is a question of the very greatest difficulty, to which no completely satisfactory answer is possible. There is, however, a preliminary question, which is rather less difficult, and that is, what do we mean by truth and falsehood? It is this preliminary question which is to be considered in this chapter. In this chapter, we are not asking how we can know whether a belief is true or false. We are asking what is meant by the question whether a belief is true or false. It is to be hoped that a clear answer to this question may help us to obtain an answer to the question what beliefs are true. But for the present, we ask only what is truth and what is falsehood, not what beliefs are true, and what beliefs are false. It is very important to keep these different questions entirely separate, since any confusion between them is sure to produce an answer which is not really applicable to either. There are three points to observe in the attempt to discover the nature of truth, three requisites which any theory must fulfill. One. Our theory of truth must be such as to admit of its opposite, falsehood. A good many philosophers have failed adequately to satisfy this condition. They have constructed theories according to which all our thinking ought to have been true, and have then had the greatest difficulty in finding a place for falsehood. In this respect, our theory of belief must differ from our theory of acquaintance, since in the case of acquaintance, it was not necessary to take account of any opposite. 2. It seems fairly evident that if there were no beliefs, there could be no falsehood, and no truth either, in the sense in which truth is a correlative to falsehood. If we imagine a world of mere matter, there would be no room for falsehood in such a world, and although it would contain what may be called facts, it would not contain any truths in the sense in which truths are things of the same kind as falsehoods. In fact, truth and falsehood are properties of beliefs and statements. Hence, a world of mere matter, since it would contain no beliefs or statements, would also contain no truth or falsehood. 3. But, as against what we have just said, it is to be observed that the truth or falsehood of a belief always depends upon something which lies outside the belief itself. If I believe that Charles I died on the scaffold, I believe truly, not because of any intrinsic quality of my belief, which could be discovered by merely examining the belief, but because of an historical event, which happened two and a half centuries ago. If I believe that Charles I died in his bed, I believe falsely. No degree of vividness in my belief, or of care in arriving at it, prevents it from being false again because of what happened long ago, and not because of any intrinsic property of my belief. 
Hence, although truth and falsehood are properties of beliefs, they are properties dependent upon the relations of the beliefs to other things, not upon any internal quality of the beliefs. The third of the above requisites leads us to adopt the view, which has on the whole been commonest among philosophers, that truth consists in some form of correspondence between belief and fact. It is, however, by no means an easy matter to discover a form of correspondence to which there are no irrefutable objections. By this partly, and partly by the feeling that, if truth consists in a correspondence of thought with something outside thought, thought can never know when truth has been attained, many philosophers have been led to try to find some definition of truth which shall not consist in relation to something wholly outside belief. The most important attempt at a definition of this sort is the theory that truth consists in coherence. It is said that the mark of falsehood is failure to cohere in the body of our beliefs, and that it is the essence of a truth to form part of the completely rounded system which is the truth. There is, however, a great difficulty in this view, or rather two great difficulties. The first is that there is no reason to suppose that only one coherent body of beliefs is possible. It may be that, with sufficient imagination, a novelist might invent a past for the world that would perfectly fit onto what we know, and yet be quite different from the real past. In more scientific matters, it is certain that there are often two or more hypotheses which account for all the known facts on some subject. And although, in such cases, men of science endeavor to find facts which will rule out all the hypotheses except one, there is no reason why they should always succeed. In philosophy, again, it seems not uncommon for two rival hypotheses to be both able to account for all the facts. Thus, for example, it is possible that life is one long dream, and that the outer world has only that degree of reality that the objects of dreams have. But although such a view does not seem inconsistent with known facts, there is no reason to prefer it to the common sense view, according to which other people and things do really exist. Thus, coherence as the definition of truth fails, because there is no proof that there can be only one coherent system. The other objection to this definition of truth is that it assumes the meaning of coherence known, whereas, in fact, coherence presupposes the truth of the laws of logic. Two propositions are coherent when both may be true, and are incoherent when one at least must be false. Now, in order to know whether two propositions can both be true, we must know such truths as the law of contradiction. For example, the two propositions, this tree is a beach, and this tree is not a beach, are not coherent because of the law of contradiction. But if the law of contradiction itself were subjected to the test of coherence, we should find that, if we choose to suppose it false, nothing will any longer be incoherent with anything else. Thus, the laws of logic supply the skeleton or framework within which the test of coherence applies, and they themselves cannot be established by this test. For the above two reasons, coherence cannot be accepted as giving the meaning of truth, though it is often a most important test of truth after a certain amount of truth has become known. Hence, we are driven back to correspondence with fact as constituting the nature of truth. It remains to define precisely what we mean by fact and what is the nature of the correspondence which must subsist between belief and fact, in order that belief may be true. In accordance with our three requisites, we have to seek a theory of truth which, first, allows truth to have an opposite, namely falsehood, second, makes truth a property of beliefs, but third, makes it a property wholly dependent upon the relation of the beliefs to outside things. The necessity of allowing for falsehood makes it impossible to regard belief as a relation of the mind to a single object, 
which could be said to be what is believed. If belief were so regarded, we should find that, like acquaintance, it would not admit of the opposition of truth and falsehood, but would have to be always true. This may be made clear by examples. Othello believes falsely that Desdemona loves Cassio. We cannot say that this belief consists in a relation to a single object, Desdemona's love for Cassio. For if there were such an object, the belief would be true. There is, in fact, no such object, and therefore Othello cannot have any relation to such an object. Hence his belief cannot possibly consist in a relation to this object. It might be said that his belief is a relation to a different object, namely, that Desdemona loves Cassio. But it is almost as difficult to suppose that there is such an object as this when Desdemona does not love Cassio, as it was to suppose that there is Desdemona's love for Cassio. Hence, it will be better to seek for a theory of belief which does not make it consist in a relation of the mind to a single object. It is common to think of relations as though they always held between two terms, but in fact this is not always the case. Some relations demand three terms, some four, and so on. Take, for instance, the relation between. So long as only two terms come in, the relation between is impossible. Three terms are the smallest number that render it possible. York is between London and Edinburgh, but if London and Edinburgh were the only places in the world, there could be nothing which was between one place and another. Similarly, jealousy requires three people. There can be no such relation that does not involve three at least. Such a proposition as A wishes B to promote C's marriage with D involves a relation of four terms. That is to say, A and B and C and D all come in and the relation involved cannot be expressed otherwise than in a form involving all four. Instances might be multiplied indefinitely, but enough has been said to show that there are relations which require more than two terms before they can occur. The relation involved in judging or believing must, if falsehood is to be duly allowed for, be taken to be a relation between several terms not between two. When Othello believes that Desdemona loves Cassio, he must not have before his mind a single object, Desdemona's love for Cassio, or that Desdemona loves Cassio, for that would require that there should be objective falsehoods, which subsist independently of any minds. And this, though not logically refutable, is a theory to be avoided if possible. Thus, it is easier to account for falsehood if we take judgment to be a relation in which the mind and various objects concerned all occur severally. That is to say, Desdemona and Loving and Cassio must all be terms in the relation which subsists when Othello believes that Desdemona loves Cassio. This relation, therefore, is a relation of four terms, since Othello also is one of the terms of the relation. When we say that it is a relation of four terms, we do not mean that Othello has a certain relation to Desdemona and has the same relation to Loving and also to Cassio. This may be true of some other relation than believing, but believing plainly is not a relation which Othello has to each of the three terms concerned, but to all of them together. There is only one example of the relation of believing involved, but this one example knits together four terms. Thus, the actual occurrence at the moment when Othello is entertaining his belief is that the relation called believing is knitting together into one complex whole the four terms Othello, Desdemona, Loving, and Cassio. What is called belief or judgment is nothing but this relation of believing or judging, which relates a mind to several things other than itself. An act of belief or of judgment is the occurrence between certain terms at some particular time of the relation of believing or judging. 
we are now in a position to understand what it is that distinguishes a true judgment from a false one. For this purpose, we will adopt certain definitions. In every act of judgment, there is a mind which judges, and there are terms concerning which it judges. We will call the mind the subject in the judgment, and the remaining terms the objects. Thus, when Othello judges that Desdemona loves Cassio, Othello is the subject, while the objects are Desdemona and Loving and Cassio. The subject and the objects together are called the constituents of the judgment. It will be observed that the relation of judging has what is called a sense or direction. We may say, metaphorically, that it puts its objects in a certain order, which may indicate by means of the order of the words in the sentence. In an inflected language, the same thing will be indicated by inflections, for example, by the difference between nominative and accusative. Othello's judgment that Cassio loves Desdemona differs from his judgment that Desdemona loves Cassio, in spite of the fact that it consists of the same constituents, because the relation of judging places the constituents in a different order in the two cases. Similarly, if Cassio judges that Desdemona loves Othello, the constituents of the judgment are still the same, but their order is different. This property of having a sense or direction is one which the relation of judging shares with all other relations. The sense of relations is the ultimate source of order and series and a host of mathematical concepts, but we need not concern ourselves further with this aspect. We spoke of the relation called judging or believing as knitting together into one complex whole, the subject and the objects. In this respect, judging is exactly like every other relation. Whenever a relation holds between two or more terms, it unites the terms into a complex whole. If Othello loves Desdemona, there is such a complex whole as Othello's love for Desdemona. The terms united by the relation may be themselves complex, or may be simple, but the whole which results from their being united must be complex. Wherever there is a relation which relates certain terms, there is a complex object formed of the union of those terms, and conversely, wherever there is a complex object, there is a relation which relates its constituents. When an act of believing occurs, there is a complex in which believing is the uniting relation, and subject and objects are arranged in a certain order by the sense of the relation of believing. Among the objects, as we saw in considering Othello believes that Desdemona loves Cassio, one must be a relation, in this instance the relation loving. But this relation, as it occurs in the act of believing, is not the relation which creates the unity of the complex whole consisting of the subject and the objects. The relation loving, as it occurs in the act of believing, is one of the objects. It is a brick in the structure, not the cement. The cement is the relation believing. When the belief is true, there is another complex unity in which the relation which was one of the objects of the belief relates the other objects. Thus, for example, if Othello believes truly that Desdemona loves Cassio, then there is a complex unity, Desdemona's love for Cassio which is composed exclusively of the objects of the belief, in the same order as they had in the belief, with the relation which was one of the objects occurring now as the cement that binds together the other objects of the belief. On the other hand, when a belief is false, there is no such complex unity composed only of the objects of the belief. If Othello believes falsely, that Desdemona loves Cassio, then there is no such complex unity as Desdemona's love for Cassio. Thus, a belief is true when it corresponds to a certain associated complex, and false when it does not. Assuming, for the sake of definiteness, that the objects of the belief are two terms and a relation, the terms being put in a certain order by the sense of the believing, 
Then, if the two terms in that order are united by the relation into a complex, the belief is true. If not, it is false. This constitutes the definition of truth and falsehood that we were in search of. Judging or believing is a certain complex unity of which a mind is a constituent. If the remaining constituents, taken in the order which they have in the belief, form a complex unity, then the belief is true. If not, it is false. Thus, although truth and falsehood are properties of beliefs, yet they are, in a sense, extrinsic properties. For the condition of the truth of a belief is something not involving beliefs or, in general, any mind at all, but only the objects of the belief. A mind which believes, believes truly when there is a corresponding complex, not involving the mind, but only its objects. This correspondence ensures truth, and its absence entails falsehood. Hence, we account simultaneously for the two facts that beliefs, A, depend on minds for their existence, B, do not depend on minds for their truth. We may restate our theory as follows. If we take such a belief as Othello believes that Desdemona loves Cassio, we will call Desdemona and Cassio the object terms and loving the object relation. If there is a complex unity, Desdemona's love for Cassio, consisting of the object terms related by the object relation, in the same order as they have in the belief, then this complex unity is called the fact corresponding to the belief. Thus, a belief is true when there is a corresponding fact and is false when there is no corresponding fact. It will be seen that minds do not create truth or falsehood. They create beliefs. But when once the beliefs are created, the mind cannot make them true or false except in the special case where they concern future things which are within the power of the person believing, such as catching trains. What makes a belief true is a fact, and this fact does not, except in exceptional cases, in any way involve the mind of the person who has the belief. Having now decided what we mean by truth and falsehood, we have next to consider what ways there are of knowing whether this or that belief is true or false. This consideration will occupy the next chapter. End of chapter 12.